Welcome to How to Rise in a Media Company, a campaign panel in partnership with Facebook, which is holding its Agency Women in Leadership event on October the 21st and 22nd. So I'd like to introduce Lindsay Patterson, Chief Client Officer of WPP. Tiffany Hi everyone, Warren. great to be here. <laughs> Tiffany Warren, Senior Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer of Omnicom and AdColor Founder. Thanks to be here. And Rachel Ford, Chief Executive of UM UK. Hi there. So, I mean, it feels like we have to sort of crack on first with the effect of the coronavirus. So it's showing no signs of abating at the moment, obviously. And so what, what do you as the panel think is going to be the effect of this pandemic in terms of the place of women in the workplace? I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, can I go to Rachel first? Yeah, um, I mean, look, it's a big question, isn't it? And um, it's something that all of us on this call have been thinking um, a lot about. I, I think, we, you know, in the chat that we were having before, um, I think actually when you look at kind of where we are now and where we were pre-pandemic um, is actually that, you know, a lot of the qualities that, you know, we display as, as, as females um, on the panel, I think the, the, the leadership qualities that, that we have around, I suppose, empathy, understanding, compassion, and that kind of cooperative approach to decision making. I think, kind of like post, like in this pandemic world, those qualities are, are really seen as as, um, as needed in organisations. Um, I think we can all agree when we look at, um, I suppose, one of the most successful government leaders that we saw across this uh, pandemic, the PM of New Zealand, um, Jacinda Ardern. I mean, you know, she displayed all of those qualities and skills in her response to COVID. So I think, you know, we're still in this, this fluid uh, place, but I do think that actually, you know, now more than ever, we need, we need us on this call. We need, we need authenticity in leadership. We need people to be true to themselves. So I think for me, it's a bit like, you know, women come to the fore now more than ever, our skills and qualities are needed as we navigate one of the most treacherous seas that we've ever been at so you know come forward and 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 be there i think so that's that's really my message to to kind of women women out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. tiffany you're nodding yeah i mean i'll be nodding throughout this conversation because it's one <laughs> that i feel so deeply you know i think you know from my perspective being a female leader particularly in a pandemic and being a female leader of color um and as you've you know, noted, but also just noted in the media that um, we're living through multiple pandemics, um, one of which is squarely focused on um, anti-racism and moving forward with dismantling um, systematic inequity. And so even the pandemic itself, worrying about your health, the health of your families, the health of your colleagues, um, worrying about what your team looks like, worrying about what community means in this time, because the whole remit of your job is to build community and now it's virtual. So the pivot was real, not only in my role, but as a senior female leader. And in particularly, I think what has given me solace is those qualities that are often associated with um, strong leaders that you pointed out, the PM from um, New Zealand. Um, you know, her incredible leadership, I often, like anytime I see a story about her, I gravitate towards it um, because, you know, she's goals, period. Um, and I think that Female leaders have led with that, with heart, with understanding the, the, the momentous occasion of any time um, and have used that to move not only a company forward, but a country forward. In my case, it's a company and, a, and my teams um, that I have to move forward while also uh, having concern about moving my family forward and health. So there's a lot of things that have come upon female leadership during this time. But I also think that it has given us a time to see the resilience and the beauty and the strength of, of female leadership, which is, which is a gift, um, among other things that this pandemic has given many people. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, is that your feeling as well, that, it's, that there's something that we can take from this as female leaders? Well, it's a, nice, uh, it's a nice optimistic start, isn't it? Because actually, generally, when you talk about, and I think Tiff's actually right, to, you know, absolutely right to talk about there being two crises. The first is COVID that was still 
living within but that's a you know that's been a, a pandemic for the last nine months actually the racial systemic racial inequality has been <laughs> going on for centuries um but has but has risen to the fore and i think in a way that is as impactful certainly at a societal and a cultural level as covid has been and needs massive adjustment by all leaders um i don't think it's had quite the, the obviously the economic impacts and economic impacts that all the governments around the world are trading off right now, which is literally lives versus economic impact, um, unfortunately, with COVID. Um, but I think both of them have led to all leaders having to be much more compassionate, having to be much more empathetic, having to listen to people. And some research we did across multiple markets, but, you know, one of the, the really interesting stats in the US is actually one of the things that mattered most to people was how companies, um, not how they showed up during the pandemic, people, you know, they said it's important how you act and how you show up and how you treat frontline staff and how you pivot your communications so you're not tone deaf. Um, but actually it was about how they, treat, how they treated employees because it, it's been a very personal uh, it feels very personal to people, both those, both the challenges in society. So therefore, there's a massive pivot to leaders having to think about DNI, sustainability, corporate reputation in a way that possibly might have been more um, fixed, uh, box ticking before. So I think it has, um, as Rachel said at the start, um, encourage everyone to lead with more compassion and empathy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just in terms of some of the, the, the women that maybe are not in the leadership roles, but are in that middle, that middle mm -hmm. place, um, have, you, have you heard anything about how they are dealing with this pandemic? Are they falling out of the workforce or are they, did, they, did some of them go on furlough and not return? I mean, it's a really important question, isn't it? Um, Lindsay, yeah. are you uh, yeah, I'm nodding. So I, I, I looked into it. I just wanted to, I think we all know that the pandemic in particular has affected women more than men. So the talk of a she session, lots of brands and, um, and people on Twitter talking about it. So I went to check some stats. So in the US, 54% of job losses are, um, is women's share of overall job losses due to COVID-19, but they only make up 39% of global employment. So women's female unemployment is rising uh, more dramatically than men. And it's down to two things, you know, one that women are disproportionately employed in lower, um, lower income um, uh, roles and also roles where you can't work from home. We're very lucky. We're very privileged. And I'm sure Tiff will talk about, you know, other forms of privilege, but we're very privileged in our industry that we can work from home. So actually part of our responsibility is to people that cannot do that. Um, and also women, of course, uh, carry uh, the burden or the joy of childcare. And, and we talk about actually, you know, men sort of going, oh, God, yeah, it'll be a nightmare if the school shut again for my wife or my partner. And you're like, why isn't it a nightmare for you? <laughs> it's like, and it's because women disproportionately pick up um, that their role, their natural role, sorry, not their natural role, their cultural role, societal role is to be the primary caregiver. So I think working mums, have particularly suffered and lower income uh, women have particularly suffered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I completely agree with all of that. And just anecdotally, you look at all of the articles that have been popping up, particularly in the New York Times as um, in the Atlantic, they've done really um, spectacular coverage on really the impacts of, of COVID on all levels. But there was one article in particular that caught my attention about, um, and you guys may have read this, a CEO who shut down her whole company because there was a there was sort of a, a guarantee with her husband that you know he would assume the role of uh, doing the schooling and taking care of her son. So as a CEO, she could run the company. Um, and then she realized it, when they were in situ or in the situation that that wasn't going to work, and she had to close down her company. That's a very high level example. But imagine in even small ways. You know, my sister's a teacher. She had to make a decision to teach her daughter or teach her class. Um, because she didn't want to expose her daughter um, to in-classroom situation when there was no guarantee that the school would provide um, COVID-related support for her um, in terms of making it safe. So these are small decisions that women are making in all different sectors. Um, yes, in advertising, there's an overwhelming privilege to work from home. Um, and the future of work and work from home is now going to be very different because we know that before COVID, work from home was seen as a luxury of sorts <laughs> and reserved for, you know, the upper echelons of our executive ranks. Um, yeah. and so COVID has proved 
that in fact you can work from home and be productive, but there is going to be a cost. And we're seeing that now, you know, time feels very, very different in COVID. So I was just saying to someone, I feel like I'm Groundhog Day and I'm living in March every single month. Um, so, you know, that idea of we're already in, um, you know, October and go, you know, October, November. And it's like, when we just had March. And so people are now, we're now starting to see, and, and thank you for that, um, that stat. But I think we're going to be see, seeing even more in, intense stats come our way about the impact of COVID on, um, you know, the she session, which was, which is a great term because that's what it feels like. We made these gains. We had incredible momentum with me too. Um, and we were really, you know, you're looking at across the board, not the number, not the gap shortening between in senior level ranks, but there was some momentum. And have we lost all of that? I think the question is, have we lost all of that um, because of this pandemic? Um, and it's a very scary thought. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I'd add to that really, because by all rights, the pandemic should have been a leveler at home. So I think, I think a lot of dads kind of were thrust into childcare they'd never even seen before. So it's like, right. bloody hell, actually, now I do realize that. <laughs> it's like, my God, and so actually it should have been a little bit more like shift work. And actually, as you say, we're privileged, I think, you know, in, in, in our own agency, actually, we have seen a lot of that. A lot of our focuses have been on parenting, not mothers or fathers, but parenting. And I think there has been a lot of that shift where we, um, well, you know, we've long sent a message that it's, it's, not about, it's not about mothers, it's about parents. It's about dual, you know, so on, a, on an agency level, it's about dual parenting. It's why we extended paternity leave. It should never be seen as a mother thing. It, it's, it's a parent thing. Even when you take that back to flexible working, I mean, I set flexible working up a long time ago as, a, you know, as a, actually just a good life, you know, work-life balance thing. You don't always have to be in the office doing the, you know, especially when we are on a, you would do desktop. So flexible working shouldn't even be for parents. But if you then take that back, we've got responsibilities as agencies, but then we have a responsibility as, um, you know, to the government. The government rhetoric should be around actually parenting, dual parenting, you know, we, Lindsay and I are in, in, in Wackland, so there's a long thing around stereotypes in, in advertising in that, look, we should be, you know, you look at the Nordics, I think over 10 years ago, you couldn't ever have just a mother in a baby shot. You had to have a mother and a father, or, you know, even now, you know, in the all wonderful ways that families come and, and parenting comes. It, why, it's this, why it should all the way gone back to the 1940s housewife doing all the, doing all the home energy. It's like, it's so... It's so deep seated that we have to, you know, as, as industries, as governments, as advertising, we have to just set it out that parenting is a dual responsibility and we need policies around that. We need, you know, obviously agencies to lean in. And yeah, really, it should be that now more than ever, men should realize how difficult it is and how they've got to share that burden. I mean, that's why it should have been a leveler. So we have to work hard to make sure that we don't go backwards. Mm -hmm. We go forwards. That's, that's how I keep telling my husband. He does all the shopping. <laughs> <laughs> he, does the, yeah. he does the housework. But you know, it's what we share. But as you say, we're privileged. You know, back to Lindsay's point, I worry about the lower levels where there isn't that choice. And there isn't that, there isn't that understanding, is it? It's just literally, no, it goes down back to the mother. It's not right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's sort of like building back better almost. Yes, Ho hopefully. I mean, I, I, you pointed something out that's really interesting about how, you know, advertising reflects the times, hopefully. You know, there's a lot of work that has come out um, because of the pandemic and because of the influence of George Floyd on the world. Um, it'd be interesting to see if the impact on parenting and what families look like because of COVID shows itself up in future ads or current ads. I know I'll be watching. You just, in you saying that, I'm like, I have to make a point of yeah. paying attention to that when I see the, when I see the ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, again, when I was thinking about this, I, um, I always joke, you know, I go back to Jane Austen, so forgive my Englishness, Tiff, but, you know, that idea of, and it, or not, you know, it's a slight joke, but, you know, marry well, e.g., you know, pick your partner, whether you're marrying or a partner, whatever, same-sex couple, but getting someone who shares the load, and I think Sheryl Sandberg, in a more updated version, said, you know, the world will only be truly equal when the men are doing 50% of the household chores and, and, you know, and women are doing, you know, 50% of the work. And there's a quote by an American writer, Amy Westervelt, said, we expect women to work as if they don't have children and raise children like they don't work. And like, it's just, uh, it's just untenable. And actually, I think what COVID has done is 
by forcing the whole family into one environment has shown, hopefully shown men that, that that's, um, that's not uh, something that, that anyone should aspire to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hope, hopefully it hasn't put them off any childcare though. <laughs> well, but I do think, cause actually we, um, we did some research with the IPA. It was actually pre COVID, but it was around parenting. So it wasn't, you know, mothers or fathers, but it, there was a whole thing around actually it's it, so there's a start i think 73 percent of parents were looking for that so parents were looking for that better work-life balance but then 72 percent of them were worried about asking to work flexibly so i do think it's almost that that balance that actually if you can see any positive that now that flexible work we've all proved that we can work flexibly that men and women can work flexibly um so if there is anything to come out of this i do think parents were looking for it and now they've got the opportunity to take that on. Like, if you want it, let's, let's take it on, let's share it. So I think, yeah, hopefully that's a, some positives that's come out of it, the, yeah, flexible, mm-hmm. flexibility for all, really. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, I was going to come to it later, but it feels like a, a good time to look at it now. I mean, what I've, I've looked at some of the responses to, um, like, the Black Lives Matter movement, and a lot of agencies are really doubling down on the idea of allyship and I wonder in in terms of white people um, being allied to this cause and that's how things are going to actually move on if we take if if we just look think about men are they is have they taken that mantle up in terms of trying to um, bring women on because you know you're all in a minority let's be honest we're still in a situation where most of the leaders are men. So do you think, do you think they've got the message about um, allyship and bringing, bringing women on? Who would like to take that up? Lindsay? I'll go optimistically in that, you know, I've always heard uh, sponsors and mentors who've been both male and female. So to me, um, I think there are lots of, I've had many great male role models you know, working role models in, in my life. What, what worries me is, um, is one of the downsides of the Me Too movement. I know we're moving about movements, but was that then men became suddenly, you know, frightened of being in a, uh, being uncomfortable in being in an environment, a, a more closed environment or in, more intimate environment, which you might argue a mentor or sponsorship relationship is with a woman. And it almost felt like, God, we're going backwards. But then you don't need to mentor someone in a bar in a dark, or in a dark room or over dinner. You can do it in a super professional, transparent, open environment. And actually, you can be very clear what you are doing. I think if men were vocal about, actually, I've got four high potential women that I, that I sponsor or mentor. And by the way, two of those should be people of color because actually they're even more uh, underrepresented or undersponsored because people tend to like people who look like them. So I do think um, some men have got the message. I think we have to take away sort of any nervousness or reticence around this, around the Me Too, by saying that there there are definitely clear ways um, to do it. And and men should be proud of doing it. So Mm -hmm. again, I'm going to be optimistic on that one. Okay. Rachel. Oh, sorry. No, 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 Rachel. Well, sorry, no, go, Tiffany. You go. Well, fun fact, my middle name is Rachel. So whether you go or I go, I'm happy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, so, yeah, Tiffany, Tiffany, Rachel Warren. Um, so no, honestly, I get asked that question a lot, particularly, you know, uh, from CEOs, not only within Omnicom, but outside of, and one of the key things is, you know, really uh, identifying the problem, being open to having conversations about identifying what the problem is. And typically when you identify the problem, there is a root cause for the problem. You spoke about the fact that in sponsorship, people are more likely to sponsor themselves. You know, even myself, my mentee pool is very diverse, Asian, white, African-American. I think there's always an assumption, you know, that I'm, that I'm mentoring African-American women and men, and I am, but I thought it was also important to mentor all backgrounds because we all have an impact on moving diversity forward. Um, and so, you know, identifying what the problem is and then the root cause I think addressing, I think the second thing is, is addressing and getting in touch with your empathy. You know, sitting on the glide board, one of the biggest lessons they taught me is you can't hate someone's story who you know. And we've seen that time and time again, that once empathy is created, not sympathy, but empathy. Um, empathy leads to action. And so people understand someone's story, their background, 
um, what culturally motivates them, they increase their empathy and then they're more likely to act. And I think the, the second and third part is just really identifying the systematic ways in which, you know, um, the lack of retention or promotion of women within your environment or your company is occurring on a small and large basis. I think people are, are really quick to attack and look at the larger, more obvious problems, but the smaller ones are the ones that get away from us and they're the ones that cause the most pain. And they're the ones that don't allow people to be uh, motivated to stay in the company, but also to retain them and then, you know, subsequently promote them. And so I think, you know, CEOs within the last six months have understood, and you used the term box ticking earlier, that it's not just about ticking the box and using catchphrases like it's the right thing to do or it's in our DNA. I think we're past that. That feels very 80s. We're in the, we're in 2020s. And in 2020, it's about anti-racism work. It's about rolling up your sleeves and getting to know someone and understand what their motivation is and then create a pathway to help that person get to where they're going. Because I have within my family economic privilege and I know how to use that to help my family members. In another situation, I don't have economic privilege. And in some situations, I don't even have social privilege. So I'm understanding in different environments that I'm in, what kind of privileges I have. And what I know is that specifically for economic privilege, God willing, that is renewable. Giving support to my family doesn't mean that I'm without the next day. And so I think as allies, giving support by sponsoring, speaking up, um, giving them opportunities, um, putting them, you know, I'm always, my favorite quote from my mentees is that I push them off mountains with wet wings and let them dry on the way down. I mean, that's just how I mentor. And I literally yell at them, they will dry on the way down. Because, <laughs> clap, clap. <laughs> you know, because our women, as women, are we ever, you know, we, there are opportunities that we're definitely ready for. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's other opportunities that are stretch goals. And often uh, people who are not sponsored or advocated for don't get the opportunity to participate in those stretch opportunities. And those are the ones that you get pushed off about with wet wings. And so yeah. I think if any CEO is listening to this, you know, don't be pushing people off mountains unless you, they, you know, you ask them. But the point is, is that give people the opportunities to show you what they, what they have. And so that promotion and retention won't be second guessed and that these people will fly high, whether in your company or um, in other companies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wait, yeah, I was just going to, um, this is something Lindsay will be familiar with, with as well. It's just in terms of the men as allies. And I think it's an important thing that, it, you know, both men and women are part of the conversation. It's like everybody needs to be part of the conversation. And, um, but there was a nervousness, of, you know, obviously after Me Too, um, something that Lindsay and I as part of WACL and NAVS and Advertising Association in the UK, we were... Um, involved in setting up time a time to initiative and that was really to tackle love that sexual, you know sexual harassment in the industry it's like we've got to talk about it we can't just hide it and so you know for me that conversation is key and it's about setting clear guidance about what's acceptable what's not acceptable where to draw the line you've got to have those guidelines um and then as long as everybody knows the boundaries then of course, then you have to have those conversations. It's, it's, you know, as Lindsay said, it's the, the way to draw the line is you have a you have a mentor conversation in an office space or over over a coffee, not in a not in a bar somewhere. You know, it's kind of. But so let's talk. Let's just open it up because that's a very specific thing. Being a men, being a male mentor has got nothing to do with sexual. Well, it shouldn't have anything to do with sexual harassment. It should be with like you know, he for shit. It should be about supporters and allies and and, and sponsors. And then there's also something really interesting because, you know, men can learn a lot from women. So actually, you know, there's a whole thing around reverse mentoring as well. You know, we have to, there's no point in speaking in echo chambers. We should all be learning from each other and open to those conversations. So I think, yeah, men have to be part of the conversation and they have to learn something from us, basically. Yeah, I think yeah. it's fascinating, actually. Sorry, Tiff. No, you no, no, no. I was going to say, I think it's fascinating that, and, and I think good on you, but there's part of me going, really, did it, did it take this? Um, that a lot of senior men, they'll, they'll have an epiphany moment when they have daughters who are teenagers and they suddenly go, oh yeah, yeah. maybe I want her to do really well. Maybe I don't want her to be sexually pestered. Maybe I want her to have equal opportunities. And you go, oh, really? Did it, yeah. <laughs> did it take that long? They, they think it's um, a brilliant thing to share. And I'm always feel slightly... <laughs> Oh, not sure it's a great thing <laughs> yeah, to it's, share. I think it's right up there with, you know, it's in our DNA and it's the right thing to do. There's certain, 
phrases that don't hold weight anymore because we're in 2020 and everything is so transparent. There's so much vulnerability in the world. There's so much vulnerability in leadership and people are really paying attention. Words matter. And so, you know, I think we were so distracted before COVID. We had so many distractions um, and we were on the hamster wheel and we were just going, 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 going. And we slowed down considerably. We focused on the basic things that are right in front of us. So communication and what you intend versus what you do is just really important now. And we're seeing that across the board, not just in the advertising industry, but in all industries, even, you know, a reckoning in entertainment, you know, in terms of who's the, <clears throat> we see content, but then who's writing, you know, and if you have a show that you really love or don't, and it's, it's female driven, you know, female specific, and then you find out the writers are all men, there's, you know, there needs to be congruency, you know, even recently, mm -hmm. um, Someone, I think it was Hank Azaria. He was he was voicing the voice of a black character on a comic series, and he stepped down. After mm -hmm. 20 years, he realized maybe this is not a good idea. So I think there's a lot of reckoning to your point, and a lot of leadership shifts. And I'm here for all of it because I do think that we're going to come out stronger and better on the other side. I hope that so much of the uncovering, and so much of the airing, and so much of the conversation, and so much of the truth and transparency of this moment has to has to hopefully push us to a better outcome um but we're going to be in this for a while so you know i, I tell people to to hold on and buckle your seatbelt because this this ride of transparency and you know um airing and reckoning is is really the norm now um it's the norm of business mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think i'm i'm struck by that because i think i i've seen some i think i saw a um video that you did to me with campaign where you were talking about the trappings that you know, of leadership and how it's all just completely disappeared and it's been a, it has been a leveler <laughs> oh yeah i think it was the i think it was the pillow talk that was yeah. early COVID and i was still shell-shocked <laughs> that was a good time to do an interview because i was just like i mean the an every answer was like everything has disappeared you know and what i meant by that is that your leadership right now is, is at its purest form. You don't have the trappings, you know, I'm not hopping on 20 planes. I'm not, you know, all these things that come with leadership, which is, which is um, important for doing business, of course, even, you know, pre COVID and we figured out how to do it during COVID. But I was just struck by how all of that disappeared. And so empathy and being concerned and, you know, um, go, going into everyone's home when you have the zoom calls, you know, I'm closer to my colleagues now than I have ever been. And we're so grateful for it, you know, because before we would have calls and we would, you know, talk, but now when we talk, it's really about bearing witness to what we're dealing with because it does impact how you work and it will impact various things that you do, particularly in our work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, there, has, there is a hot spotlight. Um, and one of the quotes that I just recently heard at Ad Color Everywhere from Brittany Packnett Cunningham, who was just featured actually in British Vogue, as one of the 100, you know, I, I want the title to be greatest people ever, but um, who are moving um, the progress of anti-racism along. She said, if you don't take care of the light in you, the light on you will kill you. And so I think about us as female leaders, how we, we put so many people in front of us and we take care of so many things around us that we don't take care of the light on us. And I kind of added an addendum to that, which is, I'm going to take care of the light on me so the light the light in me so the light on me feels like sunshine and not you know white hot light and so you know that's my advice to female leaders is certainly it's important to stand in your truth now and to forge ahead and to show that female leadership is is one of the things that will help us get through this but at the same time take care of yourself mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. the white hot light of being a senior female leader is very bright and it is very hot and if you don't take care of yourself and um, self-care with your family and whatever you need to do, um, you know, it, you could, you could get burned and I hate to use that metaphor, but yeah. that's what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And also I think, you know, to double down, you know, to the, without singling out Tiff, but you know, we, we have, and Rachel will know very well, we have a, a WPP country manager, Karen Blackett, who is female and, and black. And actually she, so that there's a double down. So right now, actually some of our black leaders are kind of, are, they have so many people that, that are so, um, you know, deeply upset and traumatized actually by the events of, of 2020 and actually almost yeah. the surfacing and, and, and George Floyd just 
suddenly then brought to bear, then you look back and you go, oh my God. And then hopefully people are educating themselves and looking at films and going and realizing actually the, the weight of that. But I think for some of our black leaders and particularly black female leaders, my God, I see it with Karen, so many people reaching out that actually the emotional toll must be incredibly high. Which, so that quote I think is lovely, but you know, you, it's, it's tough. It's it a is, tough time. Really people, tough. people want stuff from you and you, what, who's giving you strength? Who's nourishing Correct. you? Who's giving Correct. And that's for all, that's for all leaders, specifically female, and then drill it down even more female leaders yeah. of color that within one week in May were drawn upon to be the front of a very large boat to steer the company in a way that we had, we had never been asked before. And so, you know, I'm, I'm mostly on the phone counseling female leaders of color through this time, giving them space to protect them, to have the feelings of vulnerability and sadness and emotional withdrawal. I remember specifically typing in a group chat a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about safe space around the impending Breonna Taylor decision. I said, I hear what you guys are saying. I, I hope you create safe space, but I need safe distance to be able to process this. So as a leader, I was I was almost afraid to say that, but I, I felt compelled to say, I need a little bit of distance. So I have time to process what this decision means for me and what it says about my life and society. That's heavy stuff to, to process on any given day, but to do so when you're a female leader and then you're also a female leader leading diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, you know, is, is a really unique situation to be in and by no means do I have it harder than anybody else? But I wanted to share just truthfully, that was a moment that I grappled with. And I decided to go on the, the side of transparency and say, I need a little bit of safe distance um, before I decide what we do next. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that, I think that, that showing that vulnerability, I think that's just the, the actual sort of future of, of leadership. Um, never mind female leadership. That's the future of leadership. I think, it just feels like the days of the sort of alpha male leader. I think it just feels like that's kind of a bit on its, on its last legs, on its way up. Well, I, that's what I hope anyway. Yeah, I think alpha male leadership, you know, there's so many stories and think pieces about it. And a lot of female leaders have risen in counter to that. So the, some of our strength came from just trying to be in situations where that was the norm. I do think that there's a lot of fragility regarding the shift in leadership and how leadership is, is supposed to work and how it comes through. And so I also make room for that fragility to say, hey, I know things feel like they're shifting, um, but we need to get on board with this if we're going to make it through and if we're going to be the company that we say that we, say that we are, or we're gonna be the industry that we say we are. I'm just really a fan of what is and not what was. And I think a lot of leadership and a lot of conversations are about what was and when things get back to normal I think we, that's another phrase that we need to park in 2019 because what was is never coming back and we have to deal with what is. And what is, what is leadership look like now? What is working look like now? What is the workplace look like now? These are all what is questions versus what was. And that's, that's where I'm working in that gap of between what was and what is. And I've been working in that gap since March. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Trina, it's funny to me because just listen, like listening to you, I was thinking that what we've done as an organization is we have listened a lot more. Like you can't, you know, you, you, need, you need to be many. And, it's, and I think that, again, a trait of women is that we listen. So I think, you know, what's really important is putting together. So we have, say, you talked about safe space, like safe space is so, yeah, there was a, you know, I think we were all kind of, you know, we can take some positive that we, it, it has made us, lean into this, take it. We need to, we need to give everybody, well, we need to listen. We need to give in organizations, give everybody a voice also to then the action. Cause another thing that came out of the UK there was an open letter um, to the industry about what we're going to do about it. It's, you know, it's like, it's like walk the talk. Don't just talk the talk. So it's a bit like, listen. And then when you listen, then how's that then going to impact um, what you do within agencies or within our industry? So I think, but you can't, you can't be one person. So I think we just need, you know, having these a lot more of different spaces, different, allowing yeah. lots of different diverse voices, allowing, um, and allowing this. So like, just, you know, speaking for my own organization, we have this, this all the way through that, you know, so obviously, you know, creativity ideas come from anywhere, but actually having these open spaces where 
anybody can talk, anybody can feed things back. I just think we need to have this, this culture of listening to them to belong. So you feel if you listen to, you feel like you belong. And also it can't be just Tiffany, Rachel, Warren. It has to be many of us, doesn't it? You know, and I think that's, we've, we've certainly done that. And I think it's probably the same across the industry. It's, it's made us listen a lot more on a mass level rather than individual female leadership levels. We need to have that intrinsic to our organizations, I think. Yeah, it feels like everybody is not just listening, but acting. That's yeah. what feels different about 2020. I think in the past, yeah. people listened. Some took action, maybe did something. We maybe moved things forward but it feels like everyone's involved because everyone has a responsibility. We know that we're not gonna be able to get the leadership we want from a government standpoint. We may not even be able to get the leadership we want from an industry standpoint. So individual companies and agencies have to have a North Star that points them towards real action. You know, um, Kai Devereaux Lawson, who's with the WPP um, company, wrote a blog recently about that, is that our North Star should be action versus intention. So it's mm -hmm. always, it's been intention. I intend to do this. I intend yeah. to make a change, but yeah. it's about action now. Um, and she's yeah. one of the brightest a, mm -hmm. in the industry now. And so, you know, there's so much opportunity to get this right. And when we come out of what was into what is, you know, the thing that gives me hope is that I'm creating hopefully a better world and a better working situation. Cause I know that the, those that came before me, it was much harder and they created a situation that allowed me to be able to, to go to the levels that I've gone to. I'm always sensitive about that, that I am, I am a guardian of a certain part of a timeline and that other people took care of that part of the timeline that got me here. And so it's all of our collective responsibilities to be guardians for this part of the timeline so that when we give it to the future generation, they can soar as high as we could possibly imagine. You know, that's really mm -hmm. my daily mantra to myself. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I, mean, I think you're right, Rachel, it, both in the UK, there was the letter from the industry and then in the US, there was the call for change. And actually they're very similar, but you know, because each of them identified actions, I think the UK one had 10, the US one had 12 in call for change. And actually pretty much all agencies did sign up. So now the truth is in, what are you now doing about it? How are you tracking it? What are you systematically going to do? If you said you were setting up an inclusion council, have you done it? How is that representative of of globally actually because the, the the issues are different in in all in all our different sort of jurisdictions i mean i, I i'm on our inclusion council and actually there's one very specific task from that call for change which was about um forming a diversity review committee because this responsibility which has been started before by unstereotype alliance or CHA, which is about not perpetrating negative stereotypes in the work that that we produce because we have a responsibility because we're part of culture and society so the work and you, you spoke about that earlier Rach but um make sure we're not publishing offensive or culturally insensitive work but actually I think a bit more optimistic <laughs> than that creating work which is driving action so the choice work by um uh, P and G, which actively, to your point, Tiffany said, it's not enough to just not be racist. You've got to be anti-racist, and you've got to take action. Yes. So I think, how do we use our creative voices, and to to drive that? So that's my, you know, on the inclusion camp. But my personal one is, I now need to figure out how I form this subcommittee review process, so anyone across our organisation can flag work or campaigns or stuff that they feel is inappropriate not legal internal stuff that's a different thing but about the work we produce because we have a responsibility that maybe we never took seriously enough a to stem and stop things and that's the bad side of it but b thinking about actually how we promote and celebrate more inclusive celebrate celebra celebra can't say the word celebratory so I, have <laughs> words that I, I have words that i can't say either i just i no matter how i try well the one word for me is institution i can't say it Intersectionality? Or? I can say that. <laughs> like that, is, that, is, that is what I'm all about. But I have exactly. three words that I can't say. And my Boston accent comes out, so it makes it even worse. So, it seems like we know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Celebratory. Anyway, yes. Yes. we need to follow up on the actions we all committed to in July, June, July. Yes. So that's on us. Absolutely. And, and actually, this does, this does lead. I mean, we've touched upon it a bit, but the whole kind of issue of intersectionality, I think has very much come to the fore. And, you know, as we've spoken out about before, that, that dimension was maybe not there for me too, 
but certainly I'm again optimistic that with the BLM movement, I think there's been, you know, women, black women have been seen and there's been this recognition that there, there are these, you know, there are these double binds that you face. I mean, I had, it's just a little, it's a stat that just relates to the, the UK industry, but you've got, I think you've got 17% of female creative leaders are women. And then of that, only 5% are black. I mean, that's, that's minuscule, isn't it? And so that's just one small stat. I think um, I should source that to creative equals actually. But, you know, this kind of, this, this is the, the scenario that um, black women are facing in the workplace. I mean, Tiff, I know that you've got some strong feelings on this. Just a little you? bit, just a little bit. Um, but I, I will say this, that when you think about the small numbers, it's across the board. So creativity is the lifeblood and it, it, what's, it, it's what feeds our industry. But the numbers are low just in any like finance. You think about the, the behind the scenes and in front of house, you know, if you want to think about it like that, the numbers are really small. I, I've spent 22 years. So I've been in the industry for 22 years. I spent a good two years doing, I was an account manager. So that's how I started. And I had all the dreams. I could even go back to my journals where I wrote, I'm going to be the CEO of an agency and or the highest thing I could think of at the time was group, group account director because I had a group account director come to my college class and present. <clears throat> and I was completely going to be a journalist. I see her present. It switches my career path. I stalk her. She mentors me. And I begin my career in, in the agency. <clears throat> Two years in, I realized that my real work, my calling was doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I say all that to say that <clears throat> when I was an account manager, my intersectionality was never quite accounted for. And this is a different time. Obviously, there's so much more in an environment now that we talk about and that we train and that we have conversations about. Um, but the way that I liken it is that you can talk about gender equity and yes, you can talk about women. And yes, I can look at it as a woman, but what I'm searching for is, well, what are the things that they're saying about women of color or being a black woman? There's something specific that I'm looking for. And in following the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, if you haven't read her work, please do. She really made me see, and even someone of color, I needed to be voiced in or um, versed in what intersection, intersectionality was. And so I took it upon myself for several years to really just focus on what that meant. And looking at ways, no matter what we do internally and externally within Omnicom, try our best to, to have intersectionality as the focus and we grow out from there. Because when you account for those that are marginalized, even in the smallest ways, you account for everybody. Everybody can be seen. And you know, when you hear a story from, you know, I'll say Ava DuVernay or a Kerry Washington, women look at her and say, I can relate to her as a woman, woman of any color. But that extra push is I can relate to her as a woman of color. And that is where you draw people in. And so for me, intersectionality has been really key you know, for my personal growth, but also in the way that I mentor other people to become advocates and allies. I really have them try to understand the idea of intersectionality before they go forth and try to be an advocate. Because if you don't get that right, you cannot be there for someone who requires multiple complex sets of understanding in order to move them forward and have them be successful. And, you know, one of the things that I often see in the industry is programs that are supposed to fix people of color and make them ready for leadership. They're ready. They're ready. They just, th those opportunities have to be there for them to step into. Um, and so it's, it's really identifying, and you used the term earlier, high potential um, women and people of color within your network that are ready for that next step. Because there's always going to be opportunities, but there's not always going to be time to find out who's ready for that opportunity. So if, if one of the, the pieces of advice I give is create um, a list, an intersectional list of leaders that can be ready to step into those, those leadership um, moments at any given time. And, and that's how I see intersectionality. Everybody can see it in a different way, but that's how I see it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I kind of build on that, Tiffany, in terms of um, how you support. And, you, and Gemma, you use a stat from Creative Equals. So Creative Equals in the UK run a really brilliant program called Accelerate. So it's just so whether it's saying, look, go, go on this training, you get promoted. It, it, what it is to show is that actually we are, we are consciously biased towards you, actually, to give you more support than 
someone you know than than the next person and actually how we then promote that because it is it's very much i don't know for me looking in for me it's, it's number one like getting the recruitment right so get that you know make sure that you're you've got um a way you know blind cvs you make sure that you've got that you you're you know diversity diversity is the diversity of thought isn't it you know it's we we all know why this is a really important thing to have a diverse workforce but then to really help everybody flourish you've got to be inclusive so you want everybody to have that feeling of belonging so i think it's about making sure you've got the recruitment right but then also almost i say exponentially supporting different people in different ways and showing that but then also then at the top to role model because i think what mm -hmm. happens with women really you get women in then they say well what, what's the point of me hanging around here i'm not going to you know i'm not going to get anywhere i'm going to you know i'm going to drop out the industry it's it, it has been the same um with Bain Talent too, you've got to you've got to role model at the top, and you've got to have diverse decisions made at the top. That's the thing. That's why we need diverse voices around the table to make the right decisions. So I think um, that's the way I, I kind of approach it. From as I say, recruitment support, but then role modeling at the top to to feel that you're part of an industry that that what you know recognizes and appreciates everybody from all all shapes and sizes in their wonderful glory yeah i would say recruitment is 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 table stakes recruitment is table stakes i think where the pain point is and where there's kind of you know i don't know a bottleneck so to speak is the retention and promotion if we're gonna if we're gonna focus on anything for the 20s right because we go into this new decade it is the retention and promotion because i think in the industry i don't know if uh, what it is in the UK, but in America, we have several recruitment programs that have been around for 40 years, 20 years, 30 years, and they're sending these incredible, incredibly excited um, in just superstars into the system. It's just three to four years or three to five years, they tend to step out and they tend to look at other opportunities. So I think as an industry, we have to look at ourselves and say, why are so many people leaving during that time? And then if they stay, you know, what are the things that we are doing to make sure that we're on it when it comes to their advancement opportunities and their promotion and retention opportunities? Because that's where I, where I see the real work happening for the 20s is retention and promotion. Mm -hmm. Spend yeah. the, the 10s and the, uh, just all the way back to the 70s, uh, 1970s, doing the recruiting and, and putting in place MLK's dream, but through programs. Now in this decade, it's time to sort of act on that and, you know, retain and promote. And, you know, a year or two years from now, we sit back and we look at all these incredible senior leaders of difference of color, of different backgrounds, se sexual orientation, thriving in environments that look at who they are, one, like look at all of who they are, you know, and then you, and then also utilize that within the companies that we represent to challenge our clients and make better work for our clients. That's the ecosystem. A thriving, retained, promoted, professional color or professional of, of difference, different background um, and sexual orientation, thriving so that they produce creative, innovative work that will then challenge our clients to do better. And then it just, it's just, it's like an ecosystem. Virtu virtuous circle, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's why I, I would get at the, at the beginning so that you know, we get to the ultimate, which is giving our clients great and innovative work. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, I just, just to echo that, I mean, I think you have to, I think with women a while ago, we did work out, you know, it wasn't, I'm not sure why it took us so long <laughs> <laughs> that we'd start out 50, 50, and then something happened in the middle right. and a load of them dropped yeah. out. It's like, okay, we figured out that something for many women who were able to or chose to had children. And then that was a big challenge. So then you kind of go, oh, okay, I get it. Now let's figure out what we can do to encourage them back, to do more, to make it easier, to talk about parents, not mothers. But actually, this, it's the same with, with black or, or, with, um, or with diverse people. We, we have interns. Uh, I mean, we, we did just a next gen program, more than half participants are people of color. Interns is more than half. By the way, 70% of them are female. They are coming in their droves, but something yes. is happening. And I don't think we are quite clear exactly, exactly why that is, other than belonging, I think, Rachel, your term. But so therefore, you have to over. Not, not overdo it, I think that's, that's the wrong phrase, but you have to intentionally have programs that actively mentor women and promote women, that actively promote, high, you know, and seek out high potential black female employees. Here in the UK, we also have to do it with Asian as well. And you have to 
I don't think there could be too much because you know it ain't working right now. So actually you have to have very specific intentional programs. And then hopefully, as you said, in two or three years, we will, we won't see that drop out because right now we still are. Yeah. And I would say, and I would say that that's, that's the goal I try to keep in mind. It's like, I look at the different parts of the ecosystem and I say, okay, what's not working. And there's so many, um, you know, research opportunities to study this. Lean In is coming out with an incredible impact report on September 30th. Uh, tomorrow, if I'm doing the math right, um, where over the years they've done surveys with hundreds of companies. And I always like, I have a timer waiting for that research to come out because mm -hmm. it's so sobering, but at the same time, it's so inspiring. It tells us to keep going because you do see some strides on in particular areas, but it'd be very interesting to see when they release again next year, the impact of COVID on that movement. Um, and we can't, we can't underplay that. It's going to have a big, big impact on female leadership. You're seeing that. Um, I think it was the New York Times that put out uh, the 100 most powerful people and they broke it down by industry. We're still, not, we're still not there yet, not even close. And so the hard work of all of us is collectively to move this forward and not just as one person take it all on, but know that you're part of a greater force of good to move gender equality forward. And then at the same time, move systemic equity forward so everybody benefits not just women but everybody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay well i would just like to ask one last question to you all which is what advice would you give to a young woman looking to rise up in a media company so um i will go around i will go to rachel first okay what would i say um i would say be yourself be, there's only one of you, so don't try and be anybody else. You know, be be authentic. Um, never be afraid to show your vulnerability. I think that's you know, if you can, I think what we're seeing is you can turn that into a, a strength. So actually, take all your brilliant strengths and then um, you know you'll thrive. So just yeah, be you, be authentic, and um, and yeah, don't ever be afraid to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lindsay. Um, I would give some practical advice on building um, a circle of allies around you. Some will be friends, some will be friends from the industry, some will be people within your organization who may be, but you can be very deliberate about groups of people who you think can be useful and helpful to your career. And, and that, sometimes people think that sounds manipulative. It's not manipulative, it's just being smart. And people have done, you know, men have done it for years, but be thoughtful and purposeful and think about groups of people or types of people that can help you and make sure those groups look different. If everyone looks the same as you, then you ain't really helping, you know, this idea of expanding your circle, but you know, and that's where you'll get sponsors rather than just a mentor by expanding and asking people. Now in return, you have to be a winning participant. You have to quid pro quo. You have to also be willing to do stuff for other people, but that's how the world works. So give something of yourself out, but don't be afraid to ask for help and be very deliberate around it. People love giving you advice. They <laughs> love giving you counsel. <laughs> so don't be afraid to ask. Hey, Tiffany. Yeah, I have, um, I have, there's so many, I'm trying to like pin one down. The one that I often tell all the young women and even men that I mentor, um, because I'm an equal, equal opportunity mentor, so it's hard, but um, I, I say this really simply. Um, how I've been able to rise is, is really staying true to, you know, who I am and what I know my purpose to be. Because for me, what I do is not just a position, it's a passion. And I think very early on, I discovered that and I was lucky. Some people are not that lucky they discover that later or not at all, which is unfortunate. But really identify what your passion is, what you're passionate about. It's gonna fuel you, it's gonna wake you up in the morning, it's gonna get you paid. Um, and it may not be now. I remember very specifically taking on this role and my friends got $70,000 jobs at CPG companies with cars and apartment advances. <coughs> and I had to take the smaller room in an apartment because I was the one who was only making 22K in my first job but I was so excited, so passionate about advertising. I was the happiest among my friend group. I still say I look the youngest because I'm just motivated and um, you know, spiritually happy with the role, you know, the job that I'm doing. But in all seriousness, I was told very early on, 
by my godmother, who I now know was an impromptu executive coach in my life. But she told me, you are who you surround yourself with. And be very careful that you choose your passion and not a position. I got this advice at 11. A little overwhelming, <laughs> but over time it makes sense. It makes, it makes perfect sense now because I feel like I have a passion and not a position and you'll get, you'll get paid um, to do wh what you're happiest at. And I know sometimes that's hard because you get so many influences from friends and family, but stay true to what you want to do and what your passion is. That would be my best advice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'd just like to say, you know, I think, you know, I think all of the women have demonstrated on this, that you can be really smart and great at your job and have an IQ and know the financials and the commercials and, but you can be a really nice person as well that people want to spend time with. So don't forget that. You can do both. Oh, Sometimes yeah. women feel like there can be one or the other. It's like, no, you can be both. That's very Ruth Bader Ginsburg because her mom told her that. <laughs> and all, and oh. With all that you can do to be independent, try to be a lady and try to be nice. And that's advice that it's hard to hear these days because there's such a loss of civility. But, you know, if I ask 10 people and their compliment and their compliments back is that she's nice, then I'm like, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> oh, <I'm shocked. laughs> I think, I think, you know, it's be kind and be kind to yourself, yes. isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Self-care is so important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's been a thought-provoking and fascinating panel. I feel energised now. It's been really optimistic, which is really good. <laughs> so um, I'd just like to thank you all. And to say that um, whoever's watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And thanks for joining us. Okay then. Bye.